Represent, uh, Congressman Hines? No, maybe. You, know, <laughs> you didn't ask that. You want to announce? Everybody the only person this. who hasn't asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got this this incredible challenge for teachers in inner city schools, because so much of what we expect parents, the community, to do for those kids doesn't happen. It's all laid on the shoulders of the teachers and the and the school itself. Tom, you know, in our cities like Bridgeport, um, Norwalk, to a lesser extent Stanford, kids are arriving in the public school system way behind kids that arrive at the Greenwich school system or the new, more affluent households. And I'll say two things about that. One is that there's absolutely something to that. And that's why we need to look hard at what we're doing. Uh, by the way, before a child is born in terms of prenatal care, early childhood education, preparing a child, providing support for what are often single mothers so that they can actually do some parenting when perhaps otherwise they would be working three jobs. But the other thing I want to say there is that we also need to hold those systems accountable. And right now, many of them are failing. Charter schools, good charter schools, because there's good charter schools and bad charter schools. Good charter schools are showing how you can take a kid who has every disadvantage conceivable and allow that kid to succeed. So we know what works. It's very high standards. It's uh, schools requiring parental participation. It's more time in class. It's superbly educated and committed teachers. So it's not an either or thing. It's either parents and society or the school system. Both have to do a far better job. With parents and society, you count on community groups and parents acting like parents and churches helping people understand how important education is. Uh, on our school boards and, uh, you know, within the whole bureaucracy, we need uh, an overhaul because the results just don't uh, work for the future of the individuals involved or for the future of this country. I have no segue to this next subject, the, the shooting in Tucson. Uh, one of your colleagues yeah. uh, was, was shot, uh, a number of people killed, a number of people wounded, and you put in legislation uh, for to reduce the size of the magazine in a gun. What's the difference between having six or ten bullets or having fifteen or twenty? The damage gets done. Yeah, but, you know, again, the, the, the issue here, unfortunately, you know, when, when I got over the initial shock of seeing that Gabby had been shot, it, what really hit me hard was we should stop arguing about pro-gun or anti-gun, right? The Constitution guarantees the right of an individual to bear arms, but no right is unlimited, right? And how can we not all agree that we ought to put in place things that keep guns out of the hands of deranged people and that actually put some limitations on those guns? You know, a 33-round magazine, which is what this character had in Tucson, uh, you can't give me the logic for why you need that if you're a hunter or even for self-protection. To answer your specific question, look, this guy got off dozens of shots before somebody finally was able to hit him with a chair. If he'd had to reload after six or ten, according to this legislation, yes, damage would have been done, and we're always going to have violence in our society, but perhaps a lot less would have gotten done. And that's where the discussion ought to be. Come on, folks, there's a whole category of technology which has no rationale other than a military rationale of killing lots of people quickly. And we can say, I support, look, I personally love to shoot, but I can't imagine having the need for a 33 round magazine or a fully automatic rifle. So can we agree on the things that make some sense before we get into the you know, anti-gun, pro-gun thing? I, I hope we can, and I hope that the tragedy spurs people to be a little can bit Can you? I mean, given we talk talking about strong lobbies, <laughs> the NRA is about as strong as I get. Yeah, you know, I get asked that question a lot, and, and uh, it's very hard to move any sort of gun legislation in the Congress. And, and, and again, it really upsets me because it doesn't need to be this way. I mean, who would argue that we should uh, let guns fall into the hands of criminals and deranged people, and yet we're not willing to take the small and reasonable steps which would do a much better job of keeping those people unarmed? Well, so I'm not an optimist on this, but that doesn't mean we're not going to keep trying. <laughs> well, Jim Himes, we run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Hope to see you back here. Thanks, Tom. You Thank bet. You. Please stay tuned. The news continues.